All right, curtains on, curtains up, cameras back on. Welcome everyone, thanks again so much for tuning in, much appreciated. Uh, my name is Robert McKnight, today I'm going to be talking about Bob Marley, um, one of the most famous reggae musicians of all time, one of the most iconic musicians of all time, um, made a lot of really great music, and today we're going to be going through some tracks that maybe you haven't heard before, um, we'll see. But to start off, um, let's just go over a general introduction. Um, so he was born Robert Nesta Marley in 1945. Um, some say that, that his original birth name was actually supposed to be Nesta, and Robert was originally his middle name, um, but it was switched um, sometime either at birth or during early childhood, um, because Nesta perhaps sounded a bit too much like a girl's name. Um, and then of course later on in his life it was shortened just simply to Bob. Um, he was a Jamaican singer, a songwriter, guitarist. Um, like I mentioned, he's become one of the most um, successful, internationally successful pioneers of reggae, um, sort of an iconic representation of this genre of music. Um, he died, unfortunately, of cancer very young um, in 1981 at the age of 36. Uh, and since then, um, his, his symbol, I mean, his, his figure, um, his image has, has been represented on movies, television, books, t-shirts, um, not only as a symbol of reggae music, but of course as for peace, love, truth, these things that he stood for in his life and in his, in his music. Um, but since his death as well, his music has gone on to take on sort of a life of itself, um, finding a home in new generations, a new audience, and new generations of people, and connecting with people all around the world um, who maybe didn't have a chance to experience Bob Marley while he was alive uh, during his lifetime. His early life, um, he was born in rural Jamaica on his grandmother's farm. Um, he wasn't born into money or anything like that. Um, his father was an Englishman um, who worked on a plantation. Um, so the family did, did have a little bit of money, but it's not like they were overtly wealthy. I mean, you can see him in the picture on the right wearing some nice clothes. Um, but his father being a plantation owner meant that he rarely saw him. Uh, and in fact, him, Pardon me, in fact, his father died of a heart attack when he was only 10. Um, so his mother um, was a native Jamaican, and for, for the rest of sort of um, his childhood life, um, he was mostly raised um, by his, the maternal side of his family. Um, he attended Stephanie Primary and Junior High School, where he met his future bandmate, um, Bunny Whaler. His real name is Levy, Neville, excuse me, Neville Livingston. Um, and they lived together in Trenchtown as boys. Um, Trenchtown is a neighborhood in Kingston, and um, perhaps those of you who are already a little bit familiar with Bob Marley's music uh, will recognize the name Trenchtown from his song, Trenchtown Rock. He was involved in music from a very early age, um, from about the age of, of 12 or 13 or so. Um, he was already forming musical groups with his friend Bunny Whaler, who I previously mentioned, um, but then also Peter Tosh, who he grew up, um, the three of them all grew up in the same Trenchtown neighborhood together. Um, and one of their early bands um, also involved a couple other people named Beverly Kelso and Junior Braithwaite. Um, as a group, they were all influenced by ska and American R&B, and initially they didn't have any plans to be an instrumental type of group. Um, they wanted to concentrate on voice and vocal harmonies, um, but local, other local musicians um, who were a little bit older, a little bit more professional than they were, this group Wilson, or excuse me, Higgs and Wilson, um, you can see a picture of, their, of them on the right side as well. They taught the group vocal harmonies, um, but then also Joe Higgs, in particular, um, taught Marley the guitar. So, Trenchtown, Jamaica, the musical scene, it was a pretty close-knit group of people. Um, even the, this group here, Wilson and Higgs, they were related um, in some indirect way to Junior Braithwaite. Um, Wilson had been raised by Braithwaite's grandmother, and so there's sort of this, this big circle of connection of people who knew people. Um, I believe even there, there's some somewhat of a distant indirect relationship um, between Bob Marley and Peter Tosh um, and between their, their parents. Um, Bob Marley's first professional song um, was One Cup of Coffee. It was released in 1962 under the pseudonym Bobby Martell, um, so he didn't use his real name. Um, we'll take a listen to that song. Um, but just quickly before we do, I'd, I'd like to point out the picture, the other picture here on this slide towards the bottom. Um, it's a picture of Bob Marley, Peter Tosh, 
um, and Bunny Whaler, um, and look at how young they are. They're in their mid-teens, um, but you know, they were already making music at this time, already forming groups, playing locally. So let's take a listen to the song, One Cup of Coffee. So a fairly short song. Um, that single was originally never intended to be released outside of Jamaica. Um, it was recorded by Jamaicans, for Jamaicans, um, very much in tune with the local Jamaican music scene. And we can hear some elements um, that would recur later on in Bob Marley's career, um, some musical elements that he would reuse. But then there are also some elements of this music that are quite different from the later music that he would produce. I um, mean, for example, it's a little bit faster um, than maybe some of the, the reggae-style music that we're accustomed to when we think of Bob Marley. Um, also, the production values are, are a little bit lower um, than we might be expected from, from professionally produced music. Um, it's a little bit more up upbeat, um, in line with being faster. Um, also, the brass instruments are, are a little bit more prominent. Um, yeah, this is very much ska, rock-steady music. But moving on to the Whalers. So the Whalers are Bob Marley's most famous band, and over the course of the career, or excuse me, over the course of his career, rather I should say, uh, we can sort of think of there being two stages of the Whalers band, uh, or even another way to think of it might be um, two stages of Bob Marley's career, playing with the original Whalers um, and then playing with the new Whalers. So I'll start off by talking about the original Whalers. Um, you might recognize the name um, being related to uh, Neville Livingston's um, al alternative nickname, Bunny Whaler. Um, they went, the group went through a few names um, before deciding on the Whalers. Um, and basically, whaling uh, it just means playing good music, um, sounding good, uh, making making good sounds. Um, so they went through a few names before deciding on the Whalers in 1963, and then in 1964. Um, they topped the Jamaican sales charts with another single, Simmer Down, which sold in excess of 70,000 copies. Um, Simmer Down, is, it's a little bit similar um, to the song that we just heard. And we will listen to an early Whalers track, um, but Simmer Down isn't the one that, that I want to play for you. Um, it is a good song, and I would highly recommend listening to it. Um, but unfortunately, due to time limitations and there just being so much music for us to get through, um, there's something else that I'd rather play. But on your own time afterwards, definitely go give that song a listen. It's a really cool track. Um, at this time, in the early 60s, they started working as well with um, the legendary record producer Lee Scratch Perry. And you can see his picture um, up here at the top right corner. Um, he's an extremely famous uh, music producer who, who was also active in Jamaica. And I believe he's still active today. I'm pretty sure he's still alive. Um, but he, he's a great innovator in tone, um, phrasing, expression. Um, sort of developing new, new instrumental sounds um, and then incorporating those sounds in, into new and exciting forms of popular music. So the production and the recording that he did with the early Whalers, um, it's, there's, there's a lot of really cool music um, that he worked on, even though they only worked together for about a year or so, and it's, it's well worth checking out. Um, we're going to listen to one of the songs that, that he worked on with the Whalers, and I think you'll be pretty surprised which one it is. Um, but just closing off um, sort of the middle of the 60s, um, 1966 was, was a huge year for Bob Marley. Um, in 1966, he got married to his, his wife, Rita. Um, and he converted to Rastafarianism. Um, and then also in 1966, the Whalers were whittled down to the core trio of Bob Marley, Peter Tosh, and Bunny Whaler. And you can see their picture here. Um, up in, in sort of the left side, um, this is a picture of their first album, The Wailing Whalers. And yeah, you can see it's just the three of them there. Um, Junior, Braithwaite, and... Um, oh, that's terrible. Um, Beverly Kelso. Um, yeah, unfortunately, they, they decided to leave the group. They were producing a wide variety of music at this time. Um, they didn't initially pen themselves into one particular genre. Uh, so I also mentioned ska, rock steady, um, but then even doo -wop, um from the influence of American R&B, they were incorporating into their local Jamaican scene. Um, we're going to listen to a track from this bottom album here, African Herbsman. Uh, it's a re-release of the music that Lee Perry recorded with the, with the Whalers in the early 60s. Um, the album originally came out in 1973 or 74, um, somewhere around there. 
And the song we're going to listen to is Stir It Up. Um, so Stir It Up is probably a song that many of you are familiar with, uh, but many of you are, are probably more acquainted with the New Wailers version um, that appeared on Bob Marley's album Catch a Fire. And we're going to listen to that version as well. Um, but first, yeah, take a listen to this, this early original version. Um, you'll, you'll definitely recognize the song, uh, but it sounds very different um, from the version that most people are used to. So yeah, quite different um, from the later version that you would record uh, for Catch a Fire, but definitely some elements that are the, that are the same. Um, for example, all the lyrics are pretty much there. The pace of the song is still sort of that casual, laid-back type of feeling. Uh, and the tone of the instruments. That's, that's what I think is really extraordinary about Lee Perry's recordings with the Whalers. Uh, I mean, not, not to discount um, the production values of Bob Marley's later music, um, but wow, Lee Perry's music has such, such amazing guitar tone, I think. Um, so moving forward a little bit into the late 60s. Um, so 1969 saw the emergence of reggae in Jamaica. It was inspired by the Maytals song, Do the Reggae. And if you're not familiar with Toots and the Maytals, um, of course, you should definitely check them out, um, particularly their, their cover of the John, John, John Denver song, Country Roads. Um, great song to listen to. Um, but one way that reggae differentiated itself um, from the previous trends of ska and rock steady is that it had a bit of a slower beat, um, some more emphasis on bass, stronger use of guitar and instrumental breaks, like, for example, guitar solos, um, and a loss of brass instruments. Um, so less concentration overall on brass backing, brass riffs, and things like that. This album here, The Best of the Whalers, uh, it's not actually a compilation, a best of compilation of Whalers tracks. It's the fourth studio album by the original Whalers band. Uh, it, and it's basically um, their foray into reggae music, is a way of thinking about it. Um, it is some remixes of some earlier things, um, but all, all in all, it's intended to be a new album of original material um, that's meant to showcase that they can as well do reggae music too. Um, we're not going to listen to one of those songs on, on that album, however. Um, we are, we are, we're going to listen to a lot of reggae music coming up um, with Bob Marley's career. Um, instead, the song I chose that I, I wanted to play here is related to this last point, uh, about how during the late 60s, early 70s, um, Bob Marley finally started, not finally, but um, started to leave Jamaica um, to travel between London the UK um, and his island home, um, where he started experimenting, uh, re-reporting -re songs in, in this newer reggae style, developing a bit of a new sound uh, to expand his audience out beyond um, the island of Jamaica and maybe start attracting a bit of an international following. So instead I'm going to play one of the songs um, that was recorded actually in London. Um, it's from a demo tape um, that he recorded and one of the things that, that's unique about the songs here uh, is it's really an example of Bob Marley sort of trying to find a, a bit of a new sound. Um, so he's more, he's more influenced by English pop, um, I think we could say at this point, um, than looking back, say, from local influences um, and making ska, or overtly making ska, rock steady, reggae music. Uh, instead, he, he's experimenting um, with elements of blues and pop and rock um, let's take a listen. The song is called Splish for My Splash. So moving closer um, to many elements that would come to define Bob Marley's later sound or the sound of, of the new whalers, second generation whalers, uh, we can hear, I don't want to quite say minim minimalist, but more space in the drum patterns. Um, we can start to hear a bit more, more of a syncopated type of off-kilter almost sort of feel overall with all the instruments, how they all coalesce together. Um, we can hear more guitar riffs um, in between the different lines of the verses or in between the verses and chorus sections of the song. Um, instrument, other instruments like keyboards or vocal harmonies are forming a little bit more of a pad, um, a, a bit more, more, more of a background texture than we would hear in previous iterations uh, of, low, of contemporary Jamaican music. Um, so th this is a, a new direction, um, not just for Bob Marley, but, but for reggae in general. 
1972, Bob Marley signed with CBS Records, um, the UK division in London, and he was offered he was offered a four thousand pound pound advance uh, for making a record. This represents the first time that a reggae band had access to a state of the art studio, um, and really, I, I think uh, I think it's fair to say this: it's probably the first time, you know, that a reggae band um, was actually recorded out, outside of Jamaica. I'm not 100% sure on that, um, but I think it's probably likely. Um, as, I, as I started saying before, um, sonically the music that Bob Marley was making for, for this album uh, it was different from what was being produced back home in Jamaica on the reggae scene there. And Chris Blackwell himself, who was one of the founders of CBS Records, um, and I think Atlantic Records, um, he himself got involved in the production of, of the album, the production of the sound, um, he wanted to give the album more of a drifting, hypnotic type feel um, than the local reggae scene or the local reggae flavor um, that was happening in Jamaica. And one motivation of this was maybe perhaps to appeal um, to a bit more of a contemporary international audience uh, who were already somewhat immersed uh, in the psychedelic music of the mid to late 60s. Um, but nevertheless, Marley oversaw the album's overdubbing and, and mixing, um, so he was intimately involved with the production process. Uh, he definitely had his say in what he wanted the music to sound like. You can see here um, the pictures that I included uh, up at the top here, there are two different album covers of the same album, this Catch a Fire album, which was recorded and released in 1973. Um, the original album, which is here on the left, um, was restricted or limited to, I think it was 20,000 copies. And the original design was to look like a, a Zippo lighter. So you, you would open the top of the LP. Um, it would sort of open halfway on the middle seam here, and yeah, fold up. Um, but then afterwards, re-releases, represses um, were just sort of in this standard 12-inch uh, sleeve um, featuring Bob Marley smoking a, a really big joint. Um, the Whalers followed up uh, the, this album with 1974's Burnin, or excuse me, 73, Burnin was released in the same year. Uh, but then unfortunately, the Whalers broke up in 1974. Um, you know, the band was hugely successful, they were doing really well. Um, both albums, Catch a Fire and Burn In, um, got great reviews. Um, the band um, was selling out venues live. Um, they were getting great reviews for their live performances. Um, but unfortunately, due to artistic and ideological differences, um, Bob, Mar or Bob Marley, Peter Tosh, and Bunny Whaler, um, they felt that they had to depart from Bob Marley and go their own way. Um, when artistically, uh, they didn't quite quite feel that the direction Bob was going with his music was the same direction that they wanted to go. I mean, you, if you sort of think about it, they've been playing music with Bob Marley for probably about 15 years or so at this point. Um, and although they did get their ideas, some of their ideas through some of their compositions on albums, um, they were talented singer-songwriters in their own right. And um, Bob Marley's name just always being at the top uh, sort of always meant that they were a little bit restricted in um, what they could finally output. Um, not not through anyone's particular fault. Um, and then ideological differences, ideologically. Um, Peter Tosh, Bunny Whaler, uh, they didn't perhaps think that all, all, all the places that they were playing um, were quote-unquote um, right for reggae music. Um, they, they didn't like playing in, in freak, freak clubs. Uh, but nevertheless, you can see a picture of the band playing together here um, on stage. Um, yeah, they're a really great live group. And we'll listen to the first track from the B-side of Catch a Fire, um, the, the version of Stir It Up that probably most people are familiar with. So yeah, that's the version that probably most people are familiar with um, and really representative of the new direction uh, that Bob Wiley was, was taking reggae music. Uh, and so he didn't let the departure of Peter Tosh and Bunny Whaler slow him down. Um, he continued to record and release new music under the title Bob Marley and the Whalers. Um, whatever band he happened to be playing with, whatever the personnel who was involved with his band at the time, um, they were just always called the Whalers. Um, you know, related to, to the departure of Tosh and Whaler, um, you should really check out their solo albums. 
Um, they all released a version of Get Up Stand Up, um, all of which are excellent. I think probably my favorite is Peter Tosh's version. And um, they all released phenomenal um, solo records, or, or rather all, I should say, both of them. Um, Peter Tosh, his first solo record is really good, um, and Bunny Whaler, his first solo record is really, really good too. Um, but yeah, Bob Marley followed up with Natty Dread in 1974, um, Live in 1975, and Rostamon Vibration in 1976. Um, we're going to listen to a track from Live, and from the, for those of you who are probably who are already familiar with Bob Marley's repertoire, um, you can probably guess what track it's going to be. Um, it's one of his most famous singles, um, and it's of course the single um, that that is a live recording. Um, we'll, it's going to be no no woman no cry, and you know what? Let, let's just listen to that right now. Um, yeah, such a good song. So again, wow, what a great song! Yeah, a really nice track. Um, Bob Marley was a great humanitarian. Um, he believed in not only in peace and love and truth, uh, but of course also in equality. Um, no matter where you're from, where your religion is, where your gender is. Um, we're all people, we should all live together in harmony. Um, these three albums, Natty Dread, Live, and Rostamon Vibrations, um, they sort of represent the end of Bob Marley's stay in Jamaica, um, because someone tried to shoot Bob Marley to death in December of 1976. Um, unfortunately, someone tried to assassinate him. Um, uh, they shot both Marley, I think Marley got shot twice, and I think his wife um, was hit by a bullet as well. Um, the crime was thought to have been politically motivated and related to a charity concert that Bob Marley was going to do in a couple of days related to gang violence. Um, the perception or the belief is that um, the assassin perceived Bob Marley to be for one particular side, uh, which perhaps meant that he was against this other particular side. Um, though Bob Marley himself, I think, was just trying to be neutral um, and, and put an end to violence, uh, stop people hurting each other. And unfortunately, the phenomenon of politically motivated gang violence is still something that persists in Jamaica today. Um, quite a contrast uh, to the sort of stereotypical view um, that many of us have of reggae music. Uh, but nevertheless, Bob Marley played the show anyway, um, saying there are people, or excuse me, not there, saying, the people who are trying to make this world worse aren't taking a day off, so how can I? Um, the Whalers band that he was playing with at the time didn't perform on the concert, didn't perform the concert with him. Um, he performed with a different backing band. And this isn't, this isn't a picture from the concert, um, it's just another shot of Bob Marley playing live. Um, so Bob Marley permanently moved to London, England in 1976, um, and pretty much while he was there, he spent a lot of time focusing on music and producing, releasing, writing, recording, releasing new music. Um, he released four albums um, during the late 70s, uh, so Exodus in 77 and Kaya in 78, uh, and these two albums have gone on to be some of his most famous albums, um, some of his, his most iconic ones. Um, aside from Legend, which is his, his greatest hits album that was released after his death, um, most people cite Exodus and Kaya as their favorite Bob Marley albums, um, his studio albums. My personal favorite has always been Catch a Fire, um, but these two albums are also really, really, really both excellent. Um, particularly Exodus. Uh, that's probably my second favorite one, and, and really gives Catch a Fire a run for its money. But through these albums, um, and especially... Um, the first two, or excuse me, I'll finish off by saying that he also released Survival in 79 um, and Uprising in 1980. Um, and through these four albums, Bob Marley's music was really moving away even more so um, from the contemporary local scene of Jamaican reggae. Um, he was starting to become much more influenced by English pop, rock, and blues music. And also, um, what we can see on his last two albums, Survival and Uprising, um, the lyrics were starting to become much more political and overly religious, uh, which is not a, not a bad thing. Um, I mean, not not at all. Um, it's just a, a different transition, um, a different form of expression in Bob Marley's artistic output. Um, I should also say that Bob Marley and his band were still touring the world at this time. Um, so you know, since the release of Catch a Fire in 1973, 
Um, he'd been internationally famous and in touring all over the world and still releasing and recording these albums every year. Um, so he worked extremely hard. And uh, even after he left Jamaica, he still kept spreading um, Rastafarianism and, and the word of peace and love um, as far as he could. We'll listen to the last song uh, from Uprising. Um, it's a song that, again, probably many people are, are already familiar with. If, if you've listened to Legend or a lot of Bob Marley's music, um, the song is called Redemption Song, and in contrast to a lot of the music we've heard so far, um, it's a fairly simple recording. It's just Bob Marley playing um, on an acoustic guitar and him singing solo. Um, so not, not a lot of, of overdubbing, not a lot of, of extensive studio production, um, but it's remembered as one of his most powerful songs for how stark the lyrics are and how, how direct um, he expresses some of his ideas. So let's take a listen. Great song, powerful song. Um, I think its short length is one of the things that makes it so powerful. Um, but then, of course, also, like I said, uh, the stark, very direct lyrics. Emancipate yourself from mental slavery. Uh, have no fear of atomic energy. Um, pretty, pretty provocative lyrics. Um, so unfortunately, Bob Marley died um, not long after. Um, he died ultimately in 1981 uh, of cancer, um, but as early as July 1977, um, doctors had diagnosed Marley with cancer in his toe. Uh, so he already knew for a few years that he had cancer, um, but unfortunately he refused to allow his toe to be amputated, um, citing his Rastafari beliefs. Um, he collapsed while jogging in September of 1980, um, when he was brought to the hospital to find out exactly why or exactly what was wrong. Um, his doctors discovered and confirmed that the cancer had spread throughout his body and unfortunately progressed to his brain. So he gave his last concert um, two days later on September 23rd in Pennsylvania at what was then the Stanley Theatre, although I think it's now since been renamed. Um, I forget what the new name is now. Uh, and then he died on May 11th, 1981, um, about eight months later or so, uh, at the age of 36. Um, his final album, um, Confrontation, uh, was released after his death. Um, it was mostly a, a compilation of unreleased tracks, b-sides, demos, um, that had been uh, produced, upwardly produced, um, to, to give it a, a cohesive, um, finalized sound. As close as possible to maybe what Bob Marley would have imagined uh, his next album sounding like. And it produced probably his last big single, uh, which we'll listen to, um, Buffalo Soldier. Uh, so Bob Marley, his legacy still persists today. Um, you know, like I started off the presentation by saying, um, he's still seen as an icon and a pioneer of the reggae genre. Um, some have even elevate, elevated him a little bit higher. Um, some people have argued that he can be seen as a prophet of Rastafarianism, in that he spread um, the word of Rastafarianism around the world and introduced so many people to the faith. Um, the Jamaican Prime Minister, Edward Sayaga delivered Marley's final eulogy, um, and he said, His voice was an omnipresent cry in our electronic world. His sharp features, majestic looks, and prancing style, a vivid etching on the landscape of our minds. Bob Marley was never seen. He was an experience which left an indelible imprint with each encounter. Such a man cannot be erased from the mind. He is part of the collective consciousness, consciousness of the nation. Uh, and indeed, you know, so many of that still rings true today, um, that Bob Marley, you know, even though he can't be seen, um, we can still experience his message um, through the music that, that he left us. His final words to his son Ziggy uh, were that money can't buy life, uh, and he tried all his life to be a humble person. Um, there's a famous quote where a reporter asks him about his fame and success and how he copes with it, and he, he just simply responds, I'm not famous to me. Um, that I, I'm always the same per by which he meant I'm always the same person that, that I've always been. So that's the end of my presentation. Um, thanks so much, everybody, for sticking around through to the end. Uh, hopefully you learned something interesting. Um, I would really recommend checking out the rest of Bob Marley's music, um, you know, going through the albums, listening to them end to end. Um, there's a lot of really great music there. And then even diving into the, his B-sides, his deeper cuts, the more obscure material, um, there's even a really, uh, really a lot of cool stuff 
to discover there too. Um, if you like my slides, if you're interested in my presentation, you can find my store at teacherspayteachers.com. Um, I have a number of different musicology topics that um, I've lectured about here on Twitch, and some of which I haven't gotten around to lecturing about yet. Um, I'm always creating more and uploading them there. So if you have any requests of anything that you want to hear, maybe, maybe a topic you'd like to hear me lecture about, um, by all means you can contact me about it. Drop me a message either here, um, or on YouTube, or on Twitter, and you can find the links for those below. Um, if you're interested in having me proofread or edit any of your work, um, I am an academic, I do have a master's degree, um, you can find my store there on Fiverr.com. Um, as well, through Fiverr I also offer music lessons. Um, I'm teaching piano, guitar, clarinet, and ukulele um, currently. And so if you're interested in learning any of those instruments, um, I'd be ha more than happy to teach you. Um, if you're interested in English lessons or language lessons, um, I, I can teach English, German, and French. Um, so you can contact me or find me there. Um, if you'd like to read my blog, um, I post. I try to post every week. Um, lately I've been doing a project, or excuse me, every Friday I should say. Lately I've been doing a project about classical music, um, called Classical Music Doesn't Suck. Um, but actually I haven't posted for the last two weeks because I've been working on, on something a little bit bigger. Um, so hopefully I'll have a post, maybe not, not this week or next week, um, but yeah, soon. Um, I've got an interesting article um, yeah, that, that I'd like to share. Okay, so that's it. Um, thanks again. I'm going to sign off. Enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Uh, see you later.